What if everything were programmable? What if I could advance the slide? There we go. All right. <laughs> what if everything were programmable? To see what I mean, think for a moment about the iPhone. What makes the iPhone so popular? You could say it's the pretty slick touch interface and stuff, and that's, that's pretty nice. But that's not really the key uh, to its popularity. Rather, I believe it's the App Store. See, the fact is, the iPhone can do stuff today it couldn't do yesterday, and it'll be able to do stuff tomorrow it can't do today. That's programmability. Let's take a slightly more interesting example. Your immune system. Faced with an invader, even one it's never seen before, the immune system marshals a collection of antibodies, either ones you have or even new ones that it creates, to fight off that invader. That, too, is programmability. And finally, let's take a much more pedestrian example, your television. Perhaps you want the contrast to turn up when you're watching a movie, but not when you're watching sitcoms. Or you want the bass to be turned up when you're watching a music program, but not otherwise. Too bad. Unless Sony or Samsung or Panasonic happen to put that into your TV, you can't do that. My objective is to make everything programmable. Now, you might think that means I want to put a microprocessor into every device. But actually, I'm proposing a very different kind of computer. And the reason for that is because microprocessors are much too slow and much too energy efficient to be used for programmability everywhere. The fact is, a modern microprocessor uses as much energy as the 100 trillion cells in your body use to do 100 trillion different things, where the microprocessor is doing just one thing. Um, even allowing for the great speed of the microprocessor's frequency, it's still about a million-fold less efficient than a biological system in trying to do computation. So if we're going to build a programmable device that can be used absolutely everywhere, we're going to have to do a lot better than the microprocessor. Now, to understand why microprocessors are so efficient, we're going to need to take a closer look at them. A microprocessor-based system consists of a CPU, where the computing actually happens, a bunch of memory, and a surprisingly slow connection between the one and the other. If you want to do something such as adding two numbers. What happens is, first you have to drag the first number from the memory, then the second number from the memory, then the plus from the memory, then you can do the adding itself, which is nearly instantaneous, and then you end up sending the result back to memory. The fact is microprocessors require all computation to happen from memory to memory, and yet there's this long connection between uh, the computer and the memory. To give you a sense of the relative delays involved, imagine you're in your kitchen and you want to chop a carrot. But your kitchen has a very small counter, so you have to go to the pantry to get every single item, to get the carrot, to get the knife, to get everything. Oh, and the pantry is three blocks away. So walking back and forth, three blocks, three blocks, three blocks, that's where you're spending all of your time. And being faster by chopping the carrot isn't going to buy you anything because you're spending all of your time going back and forth to the pantry, and that's also where you're spending all of your energy. As though the distance to memory weren't a big enough limitation to the microprocessor, there's also the limitation that it can do only one thing at a time. Why don't we consider the operation as sort of the atomic piece of computation, like adding two numbers or loading a number from memory? When you run a program on a microprocessor, it concatenates a very long linear sequence of operations to produce a larger scale computation. In this sense, we can think of the microprocessor as a one-dimensional computer. Can we do better? Well, we can do a lot better. Uh, oh, I, and, and be, before we get to that, let me motivate why it's even worthwhile to build a more interesting computer than the microprocessor. There are an awful lot of reasons, but perhaps the most immediate one is the ongoing explosion of the Internet. The fact is, Internet traffic, the amount of data on the Internet, is going to quadruple between 2010 and 2015, reaching a million, million gigabytes, that's what a zettabyte is, every year by 2015. A, a truly staggering amount of data. To give you a sense of how much a zettabyte is, that's the equivalent of transmitting every movie ever made every five minutes. That's the equivalent to having 500 million people downloading video every second of every day, day and night. So a truly staggering amount of data. How is computation going to keep up with that huge explosion? And th the answer is, we have to find a better, more scalable form of computation than the microprocessor, which is too inefficient. All right, how might we build that? Well, let's start with instead of having just one uh, processing element, we're instead going to have, say, 100,000 processing elements that are a lot smaller than a microprocessor. But now we're going to interdigitate memories, small memories, among all of those programming elements, and we're going to wire the whole shooting match together. In this structure, it's possible for all of the operations, all of the computing elements to talk to memory all at the same time. So they, they don't have to have that long wait of going off to the pantry. 
But the fact is, each one of these processing elements can execute its own sequence of operations. What that means is, we now have a three-dimensional computer. We now have a two-dimensional arrangement of, of computing devices, a collection of operations for each, making three dimensions all together. And since the memories are available to all, all of these hundreds of thousands of elements can all talk to memory. All of these hundreds of thousands of elements can talk to each other. All of a sudden, we have a scalable computer, one that can run extremely quickly, but also one that takes so much less energy because it no longer has to walk to such a distant memory to get its computational work done. To get a sense of the sense of the respect in which this is a scalable machine, let's go back to our kitchen metaphor. Now, with this three-dimensional computer, basically we have an enormous army of chefs. One of them is, is chopping the carrot and passing that to another chef. Another is chopping onions, passing that to someone to saute the onions. The onions and the carrots are going to yet another chef who's adding them to a dish and so on. Basically, this kind of strategy can scale to millions or billions of processing elements. And in fact, it's not a huge stretch to think that this is part of how your metabolism achieves its highly, en highly energy efficient form of computation, that it too has some enormous number of individual processing elements, each of which are passing partially assembled molecules to, to, to downstream computation and does so in a highly parallel but also highly energy efficient way. Now, it's one thing to talk about building this kind of three-dimensional computer, which we have. Um, it's, it's a whole different thing talking about how you program such a gadget. The fact is that programming microprocessors is relatively easy because the microprocessor is this one-dimensional sequence of operations. And as it turns out, the most popular programming languages require that uh, computations be specified as a linear specific sequence of computations as well. So even when the order doesn't matter, you have to tell the microprocessor that anyway. The recipe says, add the chopped carrot to the stew. But you can't just say, add the chopped carrot to the stew. With the microprocessor, you've got to say, take this specific piece of carrot, even though you don't really care, and throw that one in first. Then take that specific piece of carrot and throw that one in first, and so on. So that the programmer is doing all the work to order the instructions is what makes it possible to program a microprocessor easily. It turns out the problem of programming a three-dimensional computer is drastically harder, exponentially harder, in fact, in the number of operations that you're trying to perform. But as it turns out, we came up with a way of automating the process of translating programs automatically into this three-dimensional computer by combining two technologies that would seem to have nothing whatsoever to do with this problem in an interesting way. One of those technologies comes from the physical construction of chips, of integrated circuits, and the other one, believe it or not, is Einstein's special theory of relativity, which seems to have nothing to do with it, but actually does. Let me show you how it works. A modern chip has billions of transistors on them. There is a very powerful software technology called circuit placement that automatically determines where all of those transistors are supposed to go as a way of optimizing the performance of the chip, the power of the chip, and stuff like that. What we realized is that we could take the technology that existed to figure out the locations of two-dimensional transistors on a two-dimensional chip and use that same machinery in three dimensions to place operations. So we sort of generalize this two-dimensional placement technology of the millions or billions of objects to place our billions of objects in this three-dimensional space. But there's a catch. We have to make sure that each operation is fed with the data it needs to perform that operation correctly. You can sort of think as of the data that feeds the operation as causes for an effect, which is the operation. So we had to find a way of making our 3D universe causal under the constraint of a speed of light of sorts, which is how fast a signal can actually move across the physical device. Well, it turns out somebody really smart already figured out how it is that you maintain causality in a universe that has a speed of light. That would be Albert Einstein. And the solution to that problem turns out to be special relativity, which provides a complete mathematical solution to the problem of how it is you maintain causality. So what we did is we took the, I know this, this sounds nutty, but really, this is how it works. <laughs> uh, so, so we took this technology for 2D circuit placement, and we ended up generalizing it to provide a 3D placement system to place operations, where we used the mathematics of relativity to decide where to put things as a way of making sure our universe was causal, to, make, to guarantee that every datum showed up at an operation before that operation was to be performed. So all right, enough, enough of relativity for the moment. Back to why you should care about any of this stuff. <laughs> Well, the fact is, today, Google, in building its, its uh, index of the web, has to look at 270 gigabytes per second. They have an enormous network of a million servers to do this. We can produce a single chip that can handle that incredible amount of data. We can do that today. 
if you look even to next year, you're going to see 25,000 gigabytes per second of web traffic. How is the inter internet infrastructure going to keep up with massively scalable programmable devices like these? If you look to 2015, more than half of that web traffic is going to be to and from wireless devices. How are cell towers going to keep up? Massively scalable programmable devices. But the long-term prize is even bigger. The fact is, in a few years, we will be able to scale these devices to many billions of computational elements in a single device. At that point, for the very first time, we can talk about engineering systems that have some of the sophistication and subtlety that only biological systems have had to date. This is the real prize. The, this, the computer science that underlies this may even give us the ability to mathematize in a more rigorous way, talking about natural biological systems the hardware to build massively scalable programmable devices, the software to program them, and the computer science that underlies both that hardware and software, that's what my team at Tabula works on. Thanks for your attention. <laughs>